Clovis. Nice to meet you. Can you tell us about your role here at the Clovis Botanical Gardens? Well, this is the fourth year we've had our spring festival, and uh, I'm the event chair for the Spring Into Your Garden Festival. Uh, we've had guest speakers. This year we're emphasizing speakers who talk about surviving the drought in the landscape. Uh, we have five presenters. So this is an educational event. And along with the educational event, we have a plant sale, we have lunch, music that you can probably hear in the background. Uh, it's a real festival, and we love seeing hundreds of people in the garden on a Saturday. And how many years have you held this? This is our fourth year to do the spring festival. And it, the emphasis is education. We want to share our mission, which is promoting water-wise, water-conserving plants in the Central Valley landscape. That was the mission when the garden was established. Uh, the founder of the garden was Gordon Russell. He observed there was no botanical garden in this region, and he wanted to see one developed, and they developed the mission of promoting water-wise landscaping. And so all of the plants in our garden are plants that use less water than many landscape plants. We're open five days a week. We've got gardeners that come out and work who like to work in the garden. I'm one of those. And then we have uh, volunteers who are now helping in our new gift shop, which just opened last fall. So those are our greeters and cashiers. And sometimes we don't have enough people to staff everything. So we're always welcoming new volunteers. Hello, I'm Eleanor Teague, the Fresno Bee columnist here at the Spring Into Your Garden Festival at the Clovis Botanical Garden. And I've been talking about how to cope with drought in your garden. I wanted to start my tar talk with something that is on everybody's mind, and that's the use of gray water in our gardens during a drought year. Gray water um, is being touted, uh, so systems are being sold, uh, tank collection, all kinds of things. And it is a, a really good way to reuse lightly soiled water. Our problem is that our water and soil here in the valley are very alkaline, meaning they have a high pH level. So I measure the uh, water at my house. Neutral is 6.5 to 7. My water at my home on a litmus test is 8.2, which is very, very high. One of the things we are constantly having to do to get plants to grow and thrive in our climate is to reduce the soil pH level. Our water is full of salts. Our soil is full of salts. You'll see a crust around the rim of your potted plants of salt buildup, salts buildup uh, regularly. We, salts is an issue. So there are several brands that are widely available that are uh, recommended. Absolutely no bleach products should go into your gray water. It will kill the microbes in the soil, and we like our microbes in the soil. We like a live soil. And the reason I'm saying use a spading fork when you transplant is because a shovel will cut the roots, and, the, the, um, uh, you, and you're going to be fighting with a big, heavy root ball. Spading forks, you can wiggle in between roots. You stand on it, you wiggle, 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 and you can pop up most of the root system uh, for your plant uh, without damaging it. And that's critical to having a transplanted plant uh, handle the, the drought that's coming. Heavy coatings of dust will actually kill our plants. Uh, spy red spider mites will come. You can use neem oil or any horticultural oil to control for the spider mites that leave the little webs on the underside of the leaves. The tops of the leaves have little yellow spots where the spider mites suck out all the juices, stippling. Manure takes uh, uh, sterilized manure, yeah. and uh, manure, the urea in uh, uh, manure takes at least two to three weeks to dissipate. Right. You can't plant right. for two to three weeks with it, and you do want to do amend your soil two to three weeks before planting right. anyway.
thank you for being here today. My name is Susan Stiltz. I'm a volunteer with the Clovis Botanical Garden. And um, thank you all for being here today. It turned out to be a beautiful day, so we're really lucky. Um, as you're walking around the garden, if you haven't seen the cactus and succulent collection yet, you should walk over there and look at it. It was just planted last year. Uh, a master gardener had to move out of his house and he donated all of his cactus and succulents. And so we were able, the garden was able to plant them in that one area and it's really, it's beautiful. It's really going to be developing nicely. They babied them through the winter because they had just been planted. They didn't lose hardly any and it's really worth looking at. So it's not the bay that you cook with. That's on the other side of the garden um, by the white tent. But um, this one is a nice large evergreen plant. And then this, of course, is rosemary. Most people are probably familiar with rosemary. There are a number of different varieties. Um, some are better for cooking. Some are better for flowers. This one is really pretty. So this tree is a um, Chinese hackberry. And it was planted at the, you know, 14 years, 12 years ago. Um, great tree. I used to work for Tree Fresno. I recommended Chinese hackberries to everybody in the whole world. And then after everybody planted them, this little white pest came in and it's called a woolly aphid and it takes over the tree and sucks up all the juices and then drips all this sap all over your car, sidewalk, house, whatever. Water-wise plants don't have to be cactus and succulents. You can see this is a garden full of beautiful plants that are considered water-wise. still takes a lot less water than your lawn. You know, it takes some water but it's not as much and you get a lot more benefit and enjoyment from these. It's a great plant that um, let me get a leaf. It has a very fragrant leaf. You can kind of crush it up and pass that around. Um, it has beautiful purple flowers in the spring into the fall. And um, it can be trained as a multiple trunk tree. And then this is the Mediterranean fan palm. This is there's a gray variety, which is this one, and then there's a regular green variety. And this is a multiple trunk palm that can, it could get to probably 20 feet tall and wide, but it has different branches on it. And if one is getting in your way, you can just kind of cut it off and it will fill in. It's an interesting plant. Probably late May, early June, it will be covered with white flowers, like a bottle brush type flower, but white and just beautiful, absolutely breathtaking. And this is the showpiece right now. This is a beautiful flannel bush, Fremontodendron, native to the foothills, absolutely spectacular. Um, I planted several of those in my yard and they kept dying and dying. And so I went to Intermountain Nursery and I said, what am I doing wrong? And he said, well, you're watering them. <laughs> they don't want any water. So that's one of the few plants that do well in our area that really don't want water. And they give a spectacular show this time of year. The nice thing about a water-wise garden is that you get different color interests, flowering interests, leaf foliage interests um, through every season. In the fall, these shrubs back here, this is called the burning bush. It's a euonymus and they turn bright red in the fall and then they drop their leaves. It does create a little berry. So you have to be able to tolerate berries if you plant this tree. <laughs> Some people can't, but um, it's breathtaking this time of year. Hi, I'm Miss Linda, and I'm with the Uncle Ephus uh, good old-fashioned string band, and I have a few jokes that I have in my pocket, so let's go for joke number one. What do you call the mushroom who buys everyone a drink at the party? What do you call the mushroom who buys everyone a drink at the party? A fun guy.
need to do it. This is the Clovis Botanical Gardens bringing to your garden festival. And my name is Ruth Salutis. I'm a master gardener. And I'm Madeline Mitchell, also a master gardener. And we're both also members of the Cactus and Succulent Society. That's right. And we're here to talk to you about succulents and cactus. Plants with scientific names. We could do a whole lecture on scientific names because they are really fascinating when you look up the derivation. They're all from Latin, and so there's, you know, there's a reason why things are named the things that they are. The second name many times is the person who discovered them. Uh, Gasterias all come from South Africa. That's the other thing that a lot of people don't understand is how many things, how many plants, almost of the majority of succulents, I'll say, come from South Africa. They look like little fists and you think, oh my god, it's horrible, it's never going to come back, it's probably dead. But then, you know, the winter comes and then, you know, the tail end of winter when it's still cool, they start to really do beautiful things, you know. My whole courtyard is full of them, so they're really pretty. I love them. Sometimes it's just a matter of finding a very cute, little, colorful um, container, you know, and then you just plant something in it. And this is a frog. Uh, yeah, and the plants are coming out of his back. Always have holes. See, there's drainage, always drainage. Now, so for example, if you had something, this is going to drain because he was obviously right. got full holes. But I, I have converted a lot of things into planters, and then I just got my drill out <laughs> and make sure that there's a hole. And if you go to if you go to yard sales looking for pots, always make sure that you check the pot on the bottom for uh, a hole. If it doesn't have a hole, um, just kind of tap it and see if it if it's porous enough for you to run a uh, drill through it. And just buy the special drill bits, and they come in different sizes, but they're drill bits that go with. Um, Tile, you know, for tiles and things, and those drill bits will go through through those things, and you can make holes on the bottom. So you find really little cute things, you know, from the 50s, or you know, little enchanting little things that at, that you might find at a yard sale. Put a hole in the bottom so that you at least get some drainage through there. I never use old soil, and if I'm using the pot again, I don't leave the old soil in there. I take the old soil out, and I have a place in my yard that nobody can see and I dump all my soil there and I just you know, put it into the soil and I start anew each time. If you look closely here, you'll see that there's rows, there's little spines, and there's aerials too. They're, they're, uh, they're the pore that the flower comes out of. That's an aerial. And then they'll, they'll also be on ridges sometimes. We'll go out and look at some of the cacti that are out in the garden and you'll see they have ridges and they have spines along those ridges. Well, that's pretty much going to tell you that's the a shape, cactus. The shape of the arms mm -hmm. and stuff are rather the ridges. Yeah, they have, you can okay. see all the line of the spines coming all, making a design on the plant. So that's more like a cactus. You see how soft these are? They don't have anything that really, although there are succulents that do have some things that'll poke you, but in general, they're not as pokey as Mostly the agaves. Yep. A lot of people think agaves, agaves are yeah. actually cactus, and that's why I just want to make that differentiation. We'll see agaves when we go look. And while we're on the subject of microclimates, this is something that I, I have one of these at home that I've had about 10 years that is still alive because it's on the south facing wall of my house. It's a succulent brief. They, I made this myself. It's going to a church fundraiser next week as an auction item. Um, and see me later if you want information on, well, well we have on our handout, we have a uh, handout where, the where I get the wreath frame, you order them online. Uh, I'm Greg Gorby with Grumfoss Pumps, uh, and the title of my topic today was uh, Sustainable Landscape, Creating Water, Fish, and Landscapes. His presentation today is titled The Sustainable Landscape, Creating Water Efficient Landscape. Welcome, Greg. Thank you. I'm glad to be with you today. Um, I thought about titling my um, my presentation today, Kill Your Kill Your Lawn, but I thought that was a little too extreme. To, uh, you guys don't even know me, so I didn't want to put, put people off uh, immediately. But uh, kind of a staunch advocate for drought tolerant landscapes, uh, and certainly uh, as well as uh, not just drought tolerant landscapes, but certainly looking at native species or, or drought tolerant uh, adapted uh, plants in your landscape, uh, particularly in arid climates. 
What do you think the average rainfall is in San Diego per year? Seven inches. A little more, a little more than that. You got one? I used to know. I was there for two years. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, I lived there. So. Okay. Do you know what it is? Probably nine or ten. It's a little bit more than here. Ten, oh, actually, it's less than here. Oh, really? Ten and a half inches of rain. So if you were to take a, a breadth of the population, just take a little swath, and you said, what do you think of a, a sustainable landscape? They're going to think, oh, it's miserable, <laughs> it's ugly, it, it's not something I want, right? It's not something that's friendly for, my, for me. It's great for other people, not for me, right? A lot of people don't understand the benefits of drip irrigation, that it can cut your water usage uh, up to 50% potentially, even more depending on how often you're switching out your irrigation timer and, and through the seasons. A lot of people are just not aware of the technology that's out there. Maybe they do it man maybe they turn on the irrigation manually, or they just have their clock set up. There are clocks out there now that have weather sensors in them that can tell you, hey, it's uh, the weather that's, they, they can change your schedule based on the predicted weather for that day. There, there's also moisture sensors that they make, and a lot of the stuff may be on display out here, so you may have seen some of the drip stuff out here. But there's moisture sensors you can put in the ground that'll tell you, oh, look, it's 70% uh, wetter than normal. Oh, I'm going to adjust the irrigation timer accordingly. A lot of technology out there that kicks the, uh, I don't want to say dummy proof, but it's, it really takes the, uh, the thought process out of, uh, out of your hands, and you can allow your timer to do these things for you. And this is Coke Hollowell uh, with the San Joaquin River Parkway and Conservation Trust. That's correct. Our website is riverparkway.org. We are buying lands to protect the San Joaquin River and preserve it. And we want to build trails, 22 miles of trail, up and down the river from uh, the state park to the 99 highway. We've only built eight miles of trail at this point. It's a very slow process because of private property and all that. Uh, but we're getting there and the trails are very nice. The most popular tr and visible trail is from Woodward Park to the River Center, which is a restored 1890s house which is now an education center. It's such a wonderful thing. We, we just love it and we have been supporters, uh, members, uh, ever since they started, I think. And I think the work that the volunteers do here is remarkable. It's very beautiful and such a needed thing. And I think in this drought that we're experiencing, it's even more important for people to come out and learn ways to have a garden and save water too. Well, part of our program is to get the public aware of what we have out here. What do you think? Common barn owl here in the valley floor. You will find uh, you'll find them throughout the United States and most parts of the the uh, large landmass world. Uh, you know, as a uh, he has not gotten into Australia other than by people bringing him there. So Madagascar, Hawaii will not have these as a native species.
Hi, my name is Ann Clemens. I'm on the board of directors and I've served for the last couple of years as president. The garden was the dream of a Clovis citizen named Gordon Russell. He had seen gardens in other cities and wondered why we didn't have one here in the Fresno area. So he uh, lobbied the Clovis City Council and with the help of Pat Wynn, who was on the city council at the time, they agree, the city agreed to let him have a trial project in, uh, on Clovis City Park land, a one acre pilot project to see if volunteers could handle this uh, situation. Since volunteers tended to come and go, they were concerned about that. Fortunately, uh, they got going. 2002, the first tree was planted, and within a year or so, the whole garden was planted out, and uh, people started coming. Oh boy, we're real happy that people started coming to the garden, and pretty soon we're going like, but we need more benches, and we need, uh, we need some place uh, with shade, and we need this, and uh, we got so many people, and we had events, and our little green tent wasn't big enough. We had to get a bigger canopy for the events, and now we need a bigger garden for events. So some people are avid gardeners, like I am, and when they travel, they look for gardens to go visit. So we get a lot of people from out of state, even out of country. And uh, some lady from Hawaii said, I don't know what any of these plants are. And I said, well, when I went to Hawaii, I didn't know any of those plants either. <laughs> so uh, it's, a, it's an interesting experience. So we're always welcoming new volunteers. So for those watching this video, if they wanted to come out and help, how would they contact you? They could call me at area code 559-287-2320. They could also call the garden uh, number. That's an answering machine, 559-298-3091. And I'm assuming, we, well, I know we can find you on the web. Yes, we have a website, yes, and they can uh, find information there about uh, volunteering, about becoming a member, participating in however they would like to be. Some of us like to just be out in the garden. Some like the garden but aren't able to work in the garden and they want to support it in other ways.